got it. Okay, we're here. It's five o'clock. Welcome, everyone. Uh, for those who I have not met yet, my name is April Dean. I'm the gallery manager in the Department of Art and Design. Uh, I'm very pleased to open today's lecture uh, with a land acknowledgement. The University of Alberta respectfully acknowledges that we are situated on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional lands of First Nations and Métis people. Uh, this is our second talk in the Visual Art and Design Speaker Series. Uh, this talk runs from 5 to 5.45 p.m. We'll, we'll aim to save 10 minutes at the end for questions. Uh, the talk is being recorded um, and we will upload to the Art and Design YouTube channel afterwards. Uh, live transcription has been enabled, um, so please feel free to click on that CC. Um, icon at the bottom of your screen uh, and live transcription should work for you. Uh, if you can keep your microphones muted uh, during the lecture, that helps everyone be able to hear. Um, toward the end, if you want to unmute and ask questions audibly, you're welcome to, uh, but you're also very welcome to use the hands up emoji uh, or add questions into the chat. Um, thanks for your patience with my housekeeping. Um, with special thanks to the Worth Institute for supporting this speaker, it is my absolute pleasure uh, to introduce Eva Belangic Targosh. Uh, Eva is a lecturer at the Institute of Literary Studies in the Faculty of Humanities. Her main academic interests are carnival, modernism, art history, and movie studies. In 2019, she was a guest lecturer at the University of Eastern Finland. Currently, she teaches Introduction to American Film, North American Art History, and Creative Writing, as well as writing for the media. She has recently published a book titled Tropes of Taramachi, Representations of Bullfighting in Selected Texts of Anglophone Literature. She is also a certified brewer. Uh, please help me in welcoming Eva. And Eva, I will stop sharing and pass the screen over to you. Thank you so much. Um, hello, everyone. I know that perhaps uh, Monday, uh, five o'clock, it's, you know, you may have uh, had better plans, but thank you for being here. Um, thank you for the University of Alberta for, for having me uh, and for this uh, opportunity to, to talk to you uh, today uh, and for uh, enabling the research I've been, uh, I've been working on uh, in your great library. That's been fun. Um, I've also been working on the, uh, you know, brewers and brewing part of my uh, research here. Uh, so thanks for that as well. Um, my talk is not going to be that long because uh, I didn't bring any answers. I only brought questions. Uh, so, uh, you know, lower your expectations, everyone. I will be asking questions because uh, I want to know and hopefully you can um, help me out with uh, with the matters that uh, that are sort of um, buckling. Uh, also, I had entirely different introduction for this uh, for this talk, but um, because Netflix is live, I've been watching uh, the TV series uh, about the serial killer uh, Jeffrey Drummer. I don't know if you guys have seen it, um, but in one of the episodes, um, he meets and he talks to a Polish uh, butcher. And this was the you know, secondhand embarrassment and also um, very, very true. And it was funny because it was uh, true. So if you guys have some time, you can uh, watch this short uh, clip when, when the serial killer uh, talks to the Polish butcher because it does, unfortunately, sadly, but also funnily, it, it, it does refer to the, uh, to the works uh, that I wanted to, to show you um, today. Uh, so, so just um, I had a different introduction, but this is the one I'm going with because it's so current and, and the sort of image of a Polish, let's say, butcher is still, uh, or the stereotype of a Polish butcher uh, is so very, very uh, funny and 
and unfortunately, I think there might be some truth to that as well. So, so please, uh, if you're not into serial killers, at least this little clip will, will give you um, will give you some intel. Um, so, the artist that I uh, I'm going to talk to. Um, I hope you can see the screen. By the way, I'm sorry. There should be. Thank you. Um, talk to you uh, today is uh, Jerzy Dudagracz. Um, he is uh, unfortunately no longer with us, uh, but first I will give you a little bit uh, of background information on, on him or, or where he grew up, uh, and then I will discuss a few of his, of his works so you can uh, see what we're uh, dealing with and, and how his aesthetics um, relates with, uh, with the picture of the butcher that will be stuck with me uh, forever probably. Um, he was born in Silesia, which is in the south of Poland. This is, um, or used to be rather, a, a mining industrial re region, uh, actually not unlike Edmonton uh, itself. Um, he was born into this not very uh, well or not very affluent uh, family, uh, but he managed to be properly educated in the, in the sort of art of paint and painting. He was a painter, he was a scenographer, uh, and in his final years, he was also a professor at the University of Silesia. Uh, so, so we shared that little um, part. Um, and I actually was um, lucky enough to uh, attend the same high school as, as, his, um, as his daughter, who is now a very popular um, theater director in, in Poland. Um, his works were exhibited in almost 200 national and international um, exhibitions and art galleries. Um, you can see his works in the Polish National Museum in the Warsaw, in the Museum of Jagiellonian University in, in Krakow. Um, you can see him uh, in, in um, Collegium Maius, in uh, Polish Academy of Sciences, in Moscow, which is not so cool anymore, um, in Vienna, um, even he made it to the Vatican collection um, because at the end of his life, he was, um, uh, he, he painted uh, sort of, uh, he used religious themes, but um, also he used grotesque and then he disagreed with the church. It was a whole, it was a whole thing, but eventually he made it to the Vatican uh, collection. He also made it to, you know, Louvre, France, which is uh, probably one of the biggest uh, accomplishments. Um, his works, as you can see from this sort of um, first glimpse, are not that pretty, whatever pretty means. Uh, there is some um, there is some ugliness to them and, and, and the colors are not that happy. The proportions are off. Um, there is something un unsettling uh, in his in his canvases. Uh, and he created works that present and also our social commentary uh, on the political framework, the socio-political, even economic framework of both communist and post-communist uh, Poland, and also at the sort of turn of, of these two, um, two eras. Uh, his bitter and ironic paintings, um, I would say, render him a very sort of acute and honest observer, which is, you know, the worst kind of observer, right? If, if they give you just the, the truth straight away, straightforwardly. Um, and he observed those Polish vice and sometimes absurd customs, and he used them in, in, his, in his paintings. And he was in a way, I don't want to say obsessed, but her, perhaps dedicated to the Polish scene. Uh, I will just read uh, titles of few of his series of paintings. It was Polish themes and portraits, Polish themes, Polish landscapes, and provincial and municipal paintings. So uh, clearly he had a type. Um, in all of those series or in majority of the series, Silesia, so this industrial region uh, was the main, the dominant factor. And I will quote one of his interviews. Um, he admitted himself, he says, quote, I only paint, uh, paint in Poland as Poland is my disease. Unquote. So in this short talk, I'd like to, or I'd like us to try to find the symptoms of this Polish disease and possibly the cure if there ever is one, but not only for the 
specifically Polish illness, if you will, but this sort of very frightful and very scary matter of one's identity, right? If you have to take a mirror and look at yourself with all the vice and the traditions and absurd things you do because you were born Polish or because you were born Canadian, you know, it's it's a lot to take. And sometimes it's easier not to look at yourself. And this makes me uh, think of, well, another TV series. I'm sorry, guys, uh, The Crown. I've been rewatching it, uh, perhaps, more and more people uh, have been rewatching it recently. Um, and there's one episode when uh, Winston Churchill is um, is given a portrait because it was his birthday and 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 um, the house decided or two houses decided uh, to award him or to gift him uh, this this portrait of him. And he hates it. He absolutely hates the artist. He dislikes the painting. The painting gets destroyed. Uh, and I think the reason for his anger was not because the artist didn't do his best, because he did, or because the, um, the, the, the painting was done sort of carelessly, because it wasn't. It was because he identified himself or, or, or he related to the person depicted and he did not like it because the portrait wasn't airbrushed or it wasn't you know insta filtered or whatever it was just the way that was genuine and probably this is very similar to to the works of Duda Graj that perhaps you recognize yourself in them or I may recognize myself in them and I have this you know reaction instant reaction of yuck I don't want to look at it I don't want to identify with it but at the same time, I can immediately recognize what he's talking about because it's so deeply rooted in, in the way I was brought up or the way Polish people were um, sort of brought, brought up. Um, so the paintings uh, that I wanted to, to show you and to talk briefly about, um, they reflect the sort of dim circumstances of Polish transformations of the early 90s. So the transformation was, of course, from the sort of um, the, the Pol Polish or Poland's political system shifted from Soviets approved communism to, you know, free market, democracy, first democratic elections. So, so it was a big, positive, joyous change uh, in general. But the image or, or the images of this transformation uh, is in his eyes not so happy. It's rather hospitable. It's, 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 um, it's not hospitable and it's not kind. Um, this landscape and cityscape that he captured, they are rather full of anxiety, which I believe corresponds with the anxiety of, of people of that time in Poland, because it was not an easy situation to suddenly you know, find your footing in a free market, right? You've been given one job for you know, six years from the state, and then suddenly you have to find yourself and quickly into something that's so foreign, uh, literally sometimes um, to, to you. So even though this whole political economic transformation was of course, by all means a positive one, so, so because Poland finally became a free country, Duda Graj was not willing to present the sort of glorified version uh, of Silesia and Poland, but he offered, you know, a grotesque mirror uh, that should sort of, and I think it does trigger um, self-examination, but at the same time, self um, self mockery. Um, I will I will skip to the first. Um, this is of course the um, the artist uh, himself. Um, okay, Polish horse ride style for the double dealers, 1995. Um, so take a look at this um, work of art, of course. Uh, this is the official, the, the remaining two titles I've translated myself, but this one actually is like the official um, English English title for that. Um, so the first one, Polish horse ride style for the double dealers. Uh, you can see, I don't know if you find it pretty or um, less than pretty, it is something. You can see this gargantuan rider that is sitting on the shoulders of this very sort of rickety, thin, person, uh, I believe like the, the, the horse 
is a man, perhaps. Uh, the sex of the rider, we perhaps don't know. It might be a man, might be a woman. Um, however, the rickety man bends under the rider's weight. And above them, there is this solidarity flag that's sort of, you know, flattering the air. Uh, the solidar solidarity was the, the movement that um, was led by Lech Wałęsa that resulted in relatively peaceful peaceful end of the communism in, in Poland. He was the person responsible, uh, you know, for, for the talks with the authorities and eventually his persona became a symbol of free Poland. He later became the president of Poland. He was awarded the, the um, Nobel Prize. Um, but it's not so uh, also so so pretty. I will I will get that uh, to that in a minute. So we can see the solidarity flag. The horse slash person, this very thin person, is is sort of holding uh, you know strongly to it, right? It's clutching this uh, this flag shaft, uh, and the cautious or careful horseman or horsewoman, uh, they have the cross around their neck and they have the red party book uh, in their hand. And they lean rather gently against right the flag shaft, right? They deign to to touch it rather than sort of hold it firmly like the um horse slash person. Um and, and this is something that to my mind, uh it reveals their sort of indecisiveness, if I'm being kind, or perhaps their sort of manipulation, right? uh towards towards the um the horse slash person um the band figure they don't know what they are going right they cannot even raise their their head to see the horizon in front of them so the person who is sort of dictating the direction is the one that has both the the, the cross right and the party um the party book and is not so attached quite literally to the to the solidarity uh flag so so they don't know they, or maybe they don't want to know. So even though that the destination is unknown, right? With there are no signs, I do feel like they're gonna go the way this generously proportioned person wants to go. Uh, and I feel that because they have those both sort of um contradicting attributes, right? On the one hand, they have this this little red book that means that this person belonged to the communist party. Uh, and at the same time, they have the cross, which means that there is a certain level of religiousness, which is in direct opposition to the, you know, plan to the objectives of any communist party, I believe. So, you know, they are protected from both sides or or rather they, they want to be protected from, uh, from both uh, sides. Um, and this clearly indicates the sort of opportunistic double dealer, right? Because they are holding everything. Um, so, of course, Polish history is full of such hypocrites. I think any history for that matter is full of such hypocrites that sort of skillfully maneuvered through the political, you know, landscapes and, and avoided any uh, accountability. Uh, well, I, I don't want to get too political, but perhaps there are some prime ministers, some head of states that are able to uh, apologize for wrongdoings or, um, you know, try to make up for the damages they or their predecessor might have caused. And sometimes that's not the case, right? So um, in Poland, we used to have this very sort of re visionistic approach, right? That you have to show that you didn't really deal with the communist party, that you were not this double dealer. And many people were able to sort of prove that. And many people were unable to prove that. And yet um, they still belong to political parties and, and are sort of authorities and, and yield power, which is in a way disappointing. Um, so Dudagrecz, pinpoints this mechanism of those 
you know, sneaky double dealers, um, because he knew or understood that uh, it occurred very often uh, in in the past or in those rapid among those rapid political changes uh, in Poland. You could have easily avoided any responsibility if you have, you know, uh, knew the right people or were able to act in a certain in a certain way. So this only goes to show that those grand narratives of, you know, national mythology, they're often so misconstrued and so uh, manipulated. And the ones who actually carry out the changes, like the, was the case with Lech Wałęsa, um, are very often overshadowed by the people who, you know, there are workhorses and show ponies, right? And sometimes the show pony may overshadow the workhorse, which I believe is the consensus now in in Poland because so many people abuse the image of Lech Wałęsa and accuse him of, of collaborating with the Communist Party and in a way he did collaborate in a sense that he opened or he started the talks with them um, but it, it's it's very complex uh, and and there is always uh, a double dealer you know waiting for uh, for their shot um, so this painting I believe shows that uh, that Duda Gracz called it, right? He knew that this is a situation that we must be sort of aware of. Uh, and even though someone may now be preaching, preaching, right? They might've been a member of the communist party just, you know, literally a year uh, before. Um, so Valenza himself was, you know, an electrician, right? Who all he was doing was seeking a peaceful solution um, and, and, and for the end of the, strikes in, in, in Gdańsk um, when the sort of transformation uh, started or happened. Um, he is still, you know, uh, being discredited by the sort of dominant discourse or dominant political discourse in Poland, especially nowadays, because we have this very right wing uh, party uh, holding power. Um, so all those mythologies are not that crystal clear, right? And, and they are uh, sort of prone to the ugly and, and the shameful. Um, and I personally, I very appreciate the fact that he sort of dedicated this, this work for the double de dealers. So it's a warning, right? I'm watching you. I know what you're doing. Uh, and someone will always remember what you did. So the artist will remember whether you go down in, you know, history book or a poetry book or, or a novel or a painting or a song, there is always someone um, watching you. And even more so, there is always someone mocking you, which is perfect because there is nothing, I think, scarier for a puffed up ruler than mockery. I imagine this is what Trump felt. Um, so this sort of hubris um, that is, of course, I would say noticeable in politicians is, of course, found in all or within all societal strata, right? It's not you know, reserved for politicians only. I believe we are all guilty of it um, at times. Um, but sometimes hubris may be, or a part of it may be seen in a more positive light um, or sometimes not. But so let me just uh, quickly show you the, the second one. Um, yeah, it's Babel II from 1977. Oh, I'm sorry, by the way, all the, uh, uh, this picture is taken from an auction house that's called Niezłasztuka in Poland, and the remaining two is from his, uh, from the Wikipedia um, pre-commons uh, website. I'm sorry, I should have mentioned that before. Um, all right, take a look at this one. It's called Babel II. Um, Yeah, not so, you know, uh, happy again. Um, clearly, this is a parallel or a sort of a quote from uh, Peter Bruegel, the, the elder, uh, and his painting Tower of Babel from 16th century. I even have the date somewhere. It was 1563. Um, and to that work from the 16th century, what uh, Duda Gracz did, he... Uh, he added the figures of the workers. Um, so of course there is the semi-derelic tower. Uh, we can see the ruins, the sort of half of the structure, sort of 
almost collapsing. And, and what he did, he, adders, he added the, the figures of those um, workers. And this image is, well, probably and the colors especially are typical uh, for the polis uh, for the people's uh, republic of, of poland um so everything was sort of very you know dark and 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 hopeless um and and you know you had to wait six months to get a pair of jeans that were blue and otherwise you just had to it was the palette reflects the reality okay so art imitates life or life imitates art in this um in this case um also noticeable uh what is noticeable is the horror vacui right so there is the, the painting does not breathe it has so many elements it's almost tiring it's like a punch in the face with all those details that you cannot really distinguish and the colors and the hues and their faces it's just something you don't really you know you i don't think you would buy it and put it in your bedroom right to just sort of enjoy art um but it is also a reminiscent of the paintings of uh another uh dutch artist a dutch renaissance artist right so here on uh bosch because he also included so many elements so many people uh, and objects and 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 there was you know a scene a narrative everything um at all times and this is very similar uh to that but the chaos here is of a different kind because when you look at bosch's painting uh you get some moralistic didactic narrative or you have some fantastic in a sense of you know out of this word uh creatures that may be inspiring or surprising or you know unheimlich a lot of things um that may trigger positive reactions I don't think this is the case here, um, because this is a chaos that is overwhelming in a very negative sense. You can see this everyday object. There is a pipe, there is, I don't know, a cigarette, there is some junk around, scattered around the scene. Um, and instead of inspiring some sort of a intellectual, emotional reaction, you know, it it, it tires the audience, or at least it may tire uh, the audience. And this is the reminiscence of the sort of well-known metaphor of dustbin of indust uh, industrialization, right? So you get all those great achievements, all those great uh, contraptions and inventions, and then it sort of, you know, uh, overwhelms you or takes over uh, the everyday uh, life. So these are the objects that we, or they have actually already blended into our reality. Uh, and we don't even notice them, right? You don't notice the pipe or a piece of wood, you know, on the sidewalk. You don't really pay attention. But Dutagrach did. He gathered them all and he put them, uh, you know, around this Tower of, of Babel for, for some mysterious um, reason. So he watched all those details and he sort of made them an inseparable part of, of our, of, of the world around us, basically. Uh, so also, as is the case with uh, with Bruegel, right, the Tower of Babel here is unfinished and it awaits its completion, but at the same time it is gloriously contra contrasted with the inaction of the workers. They don't even look at it, I love it, uh, and they are quite content with their cigarette break, right? I don't, they, they are not sort of watching the, 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 the watch and the time and being like, okay, chop chop, let's get back to it. This isn't happening. Uh, so this is just what it is, the unfinished project and three guys sort of having a cigarette break. In the 16th century version, uh, people, once they realize that the, this cannot be completed, right, because God mixed up the languages. So in the 16th century depiction of the Tower of Babel, uh, people at some point realize the futility of their effort. And in the original, there are people sort of escaping on the boat, you know, just moving away from this failure but there is no such rush here and this is in a way you know the modern human or the modern person uh, as a symbol of vice because stupidity or or pride or laziness you know may be found um as in politicians also in in construction workers uh in you know every person uh but what the um 
what Dudagraj does here, I think he unmasks those vices, but he doesn't really make hasty judgments. I feel like we don't know who these men are. And if we actually pay attention, we may see that, of course, they might be lazy construction workers, right? Construction season lasts forever. You know it, I know it, right? There are only two seasons. Um, but at the same time, you know, there is this little yellow square at the sort of, uh, where is it? The upper corner, upper right corner. Um, and it reads 2BL, which means the second cell block, right? It's the abbreviation from the second cell block. And then if we connect it to the number that one of these men has, it's what is 2000, right? On the, um, on his shirt, right? And we connect the number and the yellow square, and we connect it to the fences that are behind them, then we might get a different perspective on who they are and what is their situation in life, right? What if they are prisoners? And what if they are sabotaging, you know, with full, sort of fully aware of what they're doing? What if they're sabotaging their assignment, assignment because it was sort of imposed on them? And this is the part that I don't have answers for. So this is the question for like you, maybe you know, or maybe you might have, you know, a better uh, read on this because I don't know. I mean, what if they are prisoners? Mo maybe they've done something wrong and this is their punishment, or maybe they are prisoners uh, because their political, um, you know, sort of standing was different from the dominant discourse, and this is their punishment, right? Just for having a different opinion. Um, so yeah, no answers, just questions. Um, and I was thinking of the original. Um, the, the, the story uh, of, of Tower of Babel, which was uh, the symbol of human pride, right? Or it was a symbol of what, a, a rebellion against God uh, because people wanted to build something much more powerful than God herself. Um, and, and as a punishment, their languages got mixed up. Um, so what if these men, by failing miserably, in building this tower or this structure and by dilly dallying, what if they're actually doing something good? Um, so this painting, I feel like shows that the people of that time and perhaps all people are always somewhere between, you know, despair and mockery and, and hope, or at least the will to do something hopeful. Um, this is very uh, unclear as to why they are not finishing this uh, this tower when, and whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. Um, so, yeah, this is my question for later for everyone. Um, this and, and this is the aesthetics, these sort of, well, I'm going to say it, ugly characters, the sort of bulbous protagonists who somehow adhere because they're willing to adhere to the silly societal norms or, or, or customs or um, you know this is um, this is good or it might be bad right so this painting particularly shows that sometimes inaction might be the best move one has uh, but sometimes it is it is not um, and there is one more painting uh, that um, that I wanted to show you, and it is called Field Hamlet. It was the same year. It's 1977. So this is the charming Field Hamlet by uh, Duda Graj. Yeah. So speaking on of sort of inaction. Um, this is the one that I think glorifies uh, or criticizes, I don't know, again, uh, in action. Um, this is Phil Hamlet, 1977. And I do believe this is a very intriguing study of sort of ennui or immobility, or um, this might be a glorification of the sort of stagnation. Uh, you know, we're sort of heading slowly towards fall. And I believe this might be our MO for some months, right? Just sort of hoping to see, sit on a couch and just like, you know, do nothing. Um, 
and it might be a good thing. Uh, so we have this man who is sitting and we have his surroundings that is completely different from the, the, the painting of the tower, right? Because it was so cluttered and, and so full of things and, and, and there was no open space. And here we do get a little bit of it, although the sky and the land are sort of bland. There is no fresh air, clearly. There is no sun, no sort of, you know, um, nothing exciting is happening. Uh, and he's sitting on a sofa of an antique sofa for some reason. Uh, so there you have it. Uh, so nothing is moving here. Nothing is dynamic, right? This is just the field Hamlet sort of uh, enjoying his, his own we. Um, and he is in the middle of nowhere. Um, and there is this beautiful contrast between him and, and the Hamlet that we might imagine or, or the Hamlet that we might have imagined when we were reading Shakespeare and when we were uh, in theater uh, watching an actor perform, right? It is said that Hamlet, I mean, the role of Hamlet, the Prince Hamlet, not the king, of course, is, is the best, is a test for actor's maturity because it's so, you know, heavy and you have to really, you know, have a plethora of emotions. And it's a, this is the test whether you're the true actor or not because you have to work so hard and it's such a demanding role. This is precisely the opposite here. You don't have to do anything to be a field Hamlet. You just sit down and you, I don't know, observe the cabbages, right? That's that's it. This is, this is what you do as field Hamlet. Um, there is, of course, the legendary skull, the sort of attribute of the Danish prince. Um, and in the in theater and in, I think in general visual traditions, uh, Hamlet is usually showed as a sort of you know holding it and and sort of speaking to it directly. This is this is his audience, right? This um, to be or not to be moment happens with the skull of Yorick, uh, but here it happens in the field cabbage. And just so you know, in Polish language, if we want to offend someone and if we want to call them stupid or empty-headed we would call them a cabbage you're such a cabbage so i believe this is also you know it carries one more uh linguistic sort of pun right um because we call stupid people cabbages or cabbages head um right just adds extra drama to it i believe so this field hamlet he's the, the sort of hat he's wearing it's called rogativka and it's a four-cornered hat which is sometimes seen as the very emblem of poland if you go to krakow you're going to see plenty of people wearing traditional costumes and this rogativka hat uh it, it usually has uh, a, a beautiful peacock feather attached to it there might be some ribbons flowers what have you but but the sort of peacock feather there is, is something that's usually um, this, you know, 99% of the time attached to it. Um, and it, this hat is worn for weddings, you know, like special occasions or, or, or bank holidays or, or um, Independence Day, that sort of thing. It's not like every day, um, but it is for special occasions. Um, and, and here you can see the feather that's attached to it. Uh, it's not, you know, peacock feather, and it's so unimpressive. Uh, but then again, so is the Hamlet. It's and why even call him that? Why would you paint a, again, sort of chunky person, uh, you know, wearing uh, a traditional hat reserved for special special occasions? Put him in the middle of nowhere with cabbages, and call him Field Hamlet. Why would you do that? You could have just called him any, you know, Polish name. You don't have to go, you know, that far to Denmark uh, to have a painting. Um, so again, is it the sort of ennui that makes him Hamlet-like? Uh, Hamlet was in a way infamous or famous for his indecisiveness, for his sort of balancing on the verge of, um, well, insan insanity uh, or pretending to be to be insane. So this indecisiveness or this stagnation clearly is found in this provincial character. Um, his look or the look on his face is uninformed at best. Uh, he maybe 
sort of longing for the past, right? For the familiar, for the known uh, sort of regime. Uh, he doesn't seem to be looking forward to the future because it is scary and it is dynamic. It is something that people had to deal with for many, many years. And he seems to be just stuck in the present. And similarly to this uh, horseman or horsewoman from the first painting, uh, there is no sense of direction and, and there is no sort of destination point. You don't really see any, you know, glimpse of sunlight sort of directing us to, you know, manifest destiny way, right? That, that there is nothing that gives you any sense of hope or purpose in life. You're just stuck with the skull of Yorick, which is not even Yorick's skull, and, and there are cabbages, and this is your circumstance, right? So that's, this is not ideal uh, for, for a person um, to, to be, you know, it's, it's not an ideal state to be in. Um, so you can see that Duda Gretsch sort of contains or, or depicts or uses elements of both grotesque and irony on the one hand, uh, because, you know, calling this character Hamlet clearly is, you know, it's mockery. But at the same time, there is this, in a way, tender sentimentalism and nostalgia uh, that he also employs. Um, and this nostalgia, I believe, it, it derives from a word that uh, I will quote now, that Duda Grad said that the word of the past is, uh, or the word of the past departs, dies, and has more in common with the word of dreams and childhood memories. So it, th there is this strong connection to the past and maybe fear of the future, maybe some sort of apprehension because the change happened um, so you know radically and quickly in Poland. Um, but even there, even though there is this nostalgia and sentimentalism, he is mostly or primarily known for those bitter overtones and this the socio-political and economic reality of the of, of the past years. And it all began with the communist era and the post-communist era and the sort of breakthrough uh, between the two. Um, what is interesting for me at least is that he painted two different Polish landscape, right? So the communist, which was very, well, it wasn't free from propaganda. And then the sort of liberated or free market Poland. So two different visions, but at the same time, his palette didn't change, his technique didn't change, uh, his style hasn't really evolved that much, which I find um, surprising and curious and peculiar at the same time, because it is, it might be, I'm not an artist, but I guess it may be challenging to express two completely different realities using the same means at this just sort of sidebar observation because I don't I imagine that would be challenging for an artist but since you guys are artists you can also tell me that um so so he used those thinly layered uh works uh but there you know you can see the brush stroke I mean you can't but you could see the brush strokes um they are there he's not pretending there aren't there uh and the color palette is actually also adequate for both, to express both the sort of realism of, of Polish transformation and the grotesque of Polish transformation. So this is also very intriguing. How do you remain the same color palette and express um, such different uh, emotions or such different um, opinions on, on, on your subject matter? Um, and I think that his controversy or the controversy around his work stems from this, unfortunately, this unconditioned reflex of self-identification. This is sort of going back to Churchill and his initial reaction of, you know, his portrait was like, no. Um, and he told his wife to hide it, by the way, and they burn it. Uh, so this is, I think, the problem, which is also the biggest asset of Duda Gracz's, uh work. So you look I mean, if you're Polish, you look at it and you instantly know 
who the person is or what they sound like or if they are this annoying uncle at Christmas who tells inappropriate jokes. We, you know, you, you see a character and you identify yourself, your family, your boss, your friend, your husband, your wife, your partner with that person. And it's terrible because you don't want people around you to be like, you know, feel Hamlet. But everyone I have, I think my brother, is a field hamlet, but I'm not telling him that. So this is the biggest success and this is the biggest burden uh, that his works carry, that uh, he created this national imaginarium with all this pretentious, terrible people that you wouldn't like to be stuck in an elevator with. Uh, but I also feel like his works aren't as honest as he might've wanted them to be, because if you want to glorify the sort of simple or the um, the people who are not in power, why, if you want to sort of focus on the common man, quote unquote, why would you introduce intertextuality? So why would you quote the old masters? Why would you reference Shakespeare? Nobody reads Shakespeare. Why would you do that? So it clearly implies an audience who must be well-versed in art and is at least educated enough to recognize those intertexts. So it is a little bit elitist. It is not so, you know, working class hero friendly as, as it might have been sort of, you know, advertised at, right? Because advertised at, because you, you have to take into consideration that not everyone may be familiar with 16th century old masters painting, right? Not many people are. And there's nothing wrong with it. They have probably more life. But um, you cannot really pretend to be something you're not. And you cannot really preach one thing and at the same time be such an intertextual uh, artist. But this is just sort of, again, um, my my comment upon uh, this intertextuality, which I personally uh, enjoy, but I don't think it's fair to ask your audience to uh, to know, right? That's why I appreciate Jeff Koons because he doesn't require me to read anything. This is good. Um, so even though Duda Gretsch may seem arrogant or, or he may seem a jester, uh, but but he is extremely attentive and, and also extremely critical um, in his observation and, and, and commentary of the People's Republic of Poland with all its you know, absurd and abnormal uh, characters. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Okay, and if you have questions or answers for me, I would really appreciate <laughs> that. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. That was really great. Um, if there are questions, folks can raise hand, use the chat, unmute and ask them, dealer's choice. Go ahead, Aiden. I guess I will begin. Thank you for the talk. Um, and I'm wondering if, um, if you could place uh, this work maybe in a broader con how, how was he received as an artist within Poland by Polish artists by the kind of artistic class I guess or, or you know through this time I'm wondering if you give a little context of 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 that right um he was appreciated. Uh, he was very popular, and he still is extremely popular, even though he, you know, he he died uh, ten like more than ten years ago. Um, but um, there was a time when he agreed or he co-founded with the Communist Party um, an association of Polish artists. Uh, because they closed the previous uh, association because apparently it was, you know, too many free thinkers. We hate that. Um, and the Communist Party ordered um, something more within the program. And, and he co-founded that. And he was accused of 
collaborating with the enemy or 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 you know a sellout uh and he responded in a uh well very funny or ironic manner he painted a self-portrait and it was called um ora et collabora which is like you know from latin uh work and collaborate which is the spin of the um uh old biblical ora et labora which is like uh work and pray right so it was it was like that and he painted this was called ora et collabora and he had uh a newspaper a paper hat made from the newspaper um that was uh, maybe i can find it even all right at collabora uh so so he sort of wanted to um you know shut the discussion um right there and then but but he was a successful painter and uh he, he he died as a sort of recognized uh, artist and his last sort of over was um uh for uh for chopin the polish uh composer right he he made like a series of of paintings um this is ora et collabora so he's wearing uh tribuna robotnicza which is the newspaper for the working class he's wearing a cross and he's wearing a medal given from the communist party so he's got all that uh you know all the fighting discursive field elements on him because he just doesn't really care and his comment was that it is better to have this sort of artistic association rather than you know nothing at all uh, that was his his explanation so that was this sort of brief moment when he was his actions were uh, criticized by the artists that didn't want to work with the communist party but other than that he was rather a shining star of uh, polish artists i actually wanted to ask a question because um if if you think of polish vice or or polish stereotype of the the worst pole or polak right sort of negatively speaking um then i have duda Gracz in mind with this sort of ugh, aesthetics uh is there a stereotype or an artist that carries the same sort of slogan or the same flag of canadian vice or canadian stereotype at its worst It's a very good question. Hmm. Oh, there we go. Someone's got an answer. <laughs> oh no, it's not an answer to that question. That was a good question. <laughs> I was just just wondering because I I did it. I I don't know that much. Uh, and I I I was wondering if this is if every country or region you know if they have such a person who holds the mirror and makes you look at yourself and it's like oh no mm -hmm. I, I think in canada sorry i'll jump in i know april will, will respond i mean one of the interesting things in canada i can't think of a single person that is like that that is kind of you know um has taken it upon themselves to sort of both analyze and illustrate and caricature and self caricature i can think of canadian artists that kind of do that and poke um uh, um i can think of i don't know somebody like kent monkman is a canadian artist who um uh attempts to sort of paint um and talk about canadian history and point out some of the activities within as an indigenous artist commenting on the relationships between indigenous people and sort of um settlers colonizer these sorts of things and and often paints in a very kind of sweeping and romantic sort of way but when you look at the pictures actually you 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 know he's clearly raising many questions of kind of our accepted histories or taught histories mm -hmm. or at least historic more historic i think there's much more question about it. so that's one person um 
I'm can you can you write it down in the chat so that I can because yeah. I will forget in like five seconds so it's better to thank you oh, okay thank exactly you. who I thought of uh when you asked the question he's the contemporary artist like still very actively painting um and historically I struggle to come up with someone um and I think part of what that uh symbolizes is that there's no agreement on what what it is to be Canadian, right? It's um, and historically Canadians have sort of not wanted to be identified. Um, uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'll have to keep I'll have to keep thinking on that one. Maybe we'll maybe something else will will come to us. Yeah. Thank you. There's some uh, great comments in the chat. Um, some thank yous. Uh, Ashley Lau has thank you uh, for pointed that. to a Chinese illustrator. Model citizen guidelines. Okay. Great. I love that. Thank you guys so much. This is very helpful because you, you can, you know, this instant, this reflex, right? You see a painting and you, you, you know, you know that this is you, or you know that this is, you know, uh, family dinner, or you know that this is Polish transformation period. So, um, and it's very difficult to shake this off, I believe, uh, to, 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 you know, not to be, like, we, I'm conditioned to recognize that. Uh, and it's very difficult to get rid of it, um, to, to see yourself in a different light. Um, but maybe we shouldn't, maybe we should some, we should also see the ugly, uh, and the shameful and the sort of grotesque aspect of, of being Polish or being Chinese or being Canadian. Um, but it's very interesting what you said that you're sort of, um, you know, undefined in a way, or, or perhaps you don't have like five labels to put on you. Right. Cause I saw the butcher in this on Netflix and I was like, you know, you couldn't be more right. It's so annoying. So it's very easy to depict a Polak, right? In in Europe, the stereotype of Polak is, you know, this vodka drinking, probably, you know, working in Ireland person. Um, I don't know what the stereotype of a Polak, which is sort of negative, right? I don't know what the stereotype of Polak is in Canada, though. Mm -hmm. Is there like when you think I'm like, you can you can be honest, like I'm not gonna, you know, cry later. Are you familiar with Bob and Doug McKenzie? No. <laughs> Tell me. I mean, you can you can look it up. Uh, it is okay. a stereotype of um, sort of your standard okay. beer drinking, hockey watching, um, uh, white suburban uh, Canadian. That okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I just googled them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's been a new public artwork in our city outside of our hockey arena made in the likeness of Bob and Doug McKenzie. So they now have high art status. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> okay, the 90s Canadian beer commercial. Why is that? Why why I wouldn't have guessed it. I, I think that's in reference to um there's a type of beer called Molson Canadian. I've seen those, yeah. And that is, some people would say the best part of it is, is its name. And there is a, tell, they did a bunch of, they've obviously done many commercials. And I'm assuming, Jackie, if I click on this link that you provided, it is the I am Canadian, a kind of. I'm copying that. A, a somewhat uh, attempt <laughs> to. Um, communicate what it means to be Canadian primary to an American audience mm -hmm. so kind of poking fun at the slight differences uh, in, in between Canada and America that Canadians often are too 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 polite to point out at least to Americans they might grumble amongst themselves but as April has noted the Canadian kind of culture or at least the idea of a monoculture doesn't exist in many ways and mm -hmm. and and it, for many good reasons but and we're very um, loath to give specific words that would apply to all the Canadians in that sort of way. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. And oddly enough, that person from that commercial is now a semi-famous radio personality that hosts a, a radio show, you know, moved into that after that sort of thing. 
Yeah. But so yes. there is career, there is. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, I think if you cross reference our hockey culture and Kent Monkman's paintings, this will give you. Some You're doing initial, pretty good. Some initial insight <laughs> into the problems of my uh, applying <laughs> an identity to Canadians. Yeah. <laughs> um, that is so good. So much, Eva. Uh, that was a real pleasure. It was great to get further insight into your research. I hope your time here has been. Uh, well spent. I hope there has been good beer. Uh, you have safe travels home. Um, for those uh, who are still with us, our next VADF engagement happens next week on, I have it in front of me, Wednesday, October 5th, uh, Sanaz Mazanani, and that is at 4 p.m. Mountain Time. Thank you so Thank much. You so much, Eva. We'll let everyone go. Thank you. Bye-bye.